and we should be recording to the cloud. Okay, so welcome everyone to the OLS3 opening webinar. Uh, so I'm going to run through a little bit of housekeeping uh, and just give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, so first of all, this is a webinar basically just to allow people to ask questions and answers about the next round of the Open Life Science program. Um, so we generally ask, if possible, that you keep your microphone on mute unless you wish to ask a question, um, in which case you can then. Uh, it's, it's fine to unmute, it's just to make sure the background noise doesn't come through at any point. Um, I feel like this is a reminder that's probably a lot less important than it was a year ago because we've gotten a lot of experience in remote calls over the last year. Uh, we do have, if you can see on your Zoom on the top left, there is the live on Otter AI button, which has a transcription so that you can follow along um, automatically what's being said. You can read that as well. Um, and I think the only other housekeeping note, oh, of course, my name is Yo, um, and we have today Malvika and also Berenice. We are the three co-founders of Open Life Science. Um, and before we get going, uh, just one quick reminder is that we have a uh, code of conduct for Open Life Science. Now, generally, that means that when you are in an open life science space or representing open life science, we ask that you treat one another with the respect that you would like to desert, that you would like to receive. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that. We do have a link in our documents in the notes. Um, and we do ask, if possible, just to spend a minute or two looking through that. And if at any point you feel like you've either witnessed or experienced behavior that's not in line with the code of conduct, then you can report that either to team at openlifesci.org or alternatively to Movika, uh, myself, or Berenice individually, um, if that is easier for you. And the email addresses are all available in the welcome document as well. Uh, I don't think I've missed any of the intro, so I'll pass it over to Malvika. Thanks, Yo. I'm going to share my screen. We'll run through a small presentation and the presentation is to make sure that I cover the grounds that we really want to convey in this webinar. Uh, this webinar is mostly supposed to be question and answer session, but uh, we are also recording it and want to ensure that everybody knows what this program delivers. So Open Life Science, uh, we have created an aim to empower communities who have any open science related principles into their project. So three of us, you just saw, Yo, uh, Berenice on the call and me, uh, we launched this program in September, 2019. And our aim uh, was to, uh, so we together think that science can advance only when every researcher shared their work with others and not uh, gatekeep, or not uh, own their work solely. One of the studies from 2012 shows that 160 tech companies found that the level of strategic intent and openness, not openness alone correlates with effective market performance. If keeping it with uh, academia, we have open air, which talks about cultural change towards open science that requires leadership, vision, and strategy, targeted measures, transparency and accountability, and trust and confidence in the shared vision. And throughout the open life science, these are the grounds that we want to touch upon. Open life science program help researchers and different stakeholders working in research field in becoming open science ambassadors. So the stakeholders could be anyone who is uh, related to research or helping researchers in their institute. So over the periods, we've also had many project managers, community managers who bring their work and scope out in the program. Together uh, with the program leaders, with mentors and mentees, we explore the important concepts and practices in open science and apply them in our work one step at a time. It's really important for us to ensure that we have an idea that we bring, bring into the program because we think that it's not enough for us to just listen in and hear what we are saying, but also apply them into our work and see how it pans out. So open science is an umbrella term. There is a lot to open science than just open source code. So there is some, you will learn about open data. You will learn about uh, developing source code, uh, designing hardware, sharing methods and protocols, communicating results early, reviewing papers, transferring skills by training, 
citizen science, networking, and community building. Uh, there could be a lot more that uh, we haven't listed in this slide yet. One of the integral aims that we have is to teach people how to open their work by design. Openness should not be a thoughtless default. So by calling your work open by default, we cannot really ensure that this is actually accessible to wider audience or you're really ensuring collaboration into your work. With OLS mentoring and training, uh, you as a mentee or the project lead will lead your projects openly share your work efficiently and bring a culture change in your communities. So the structure of program is that we will have 15 weeks long mentorship and cohort based training, which ends with another last week of graduation. Uh, we alternate between cohort based training and in this training, you would have an online call where the expert speakers will share new ideas and thoughts from their work with you. The week afterwards, you would have a one-to-one -one mentor call where we will assign you a mentor based on your idea, uh, compatible with your time zone and language. And in between, you will also have time to work on some assignments. And these assignments are essentially something that prompts you to think about how you would apply what you have learned through the cohort-based training and mentorship call into your own work. So today is a pre-application webinar. We are also thinking about holding a few short question and answer session in case you're writing your application and you're stuck, you can always contact us. The deadline of uh, application is January 11. Uh, it ends at midnight in any part of the world. Uh, and then we will also let you know by 26th of January if you've been successful. Again, if you have any doubt, if your project fits into our program, please write an email to us or uh, let us know before you send an application. Um, and then we will start our program on 8th of February and ending with graduation on the last week of May, which is overall 16 weeks. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to you uh, just to let you know that for every cohort, we keep the name, uh, our cohort members select a name. Our first cohort was called Open Seed, which ran from January to May with 20 projects and 29 project leads. In the second cohort, they were called Max, Masked Cohort, very appropriate to the time that they had been working uh, with us. And we had 30 projects, over 30 projects with 50 project leads. So the number or discrepancy you would see, it's because we actually encourage people to come in teams because we think that it is a lot more efficient because you would have someone that can hold accountability for your work. But also a lot of people bring their project as their side project. It's not something that they're working full time. So it's always nice to have more people working with you. So you to you. Awesome. Okay, I'm clicking share screen. And it looks like it's the right one. Right, can you see the OLS3 schedule? Perfect. Okay, I'm just going to run through a bit of the um, types of things that we will be covering um, for OLS3. So um, like Malvika mentioned, we actually have um, alternating weeks. So one week you spend time speaking with your mentor uh, about whatever project it is you may be working on to do with open science or open research. Because um, I think th this is sometimes more broad than just science and we have people from humanities and other areas. Um, and then every other week we have the cohort calls. So um, week one, start of February, meet your mentor. And then week, week two, we have a welcome to open life science. Uh, this tends to be a big broad call with everyone from the um, OLS cohort who is participating or at least as many who can make it for the time zones. And we make sure that if you can't make it that it's uploaded to YouTube so that you can actually watch it later on because we recognize that there's a lot of time zones in the world and it's very hard to be awake and available for all of them. Uh, but we spend a little bit of time actually talking about the project vision, sort of introducing it to each other uh, in small groups and just getting to know everyone else who's in the group for the first week. After that, week three, you meet your mentor again. 
Uh, and then for the next week is when we really start getting into some of the open collaboration tools. So week three, uh, sorry, week four rather, we start talking about tooling and road mapping, mapping for open projects. And this is where we tend to bring in expert speakers from various different um, open research and science related domains. And we share some uh, different talks. So they tend to be about 10 minutes each. They're enough to sort of give you a bit of a taster for each of these subjects so that you can then pursue them later and, and find more of it later if you wish to do so. So we talk about using uh, GitHub as a hub for a community and that's actually a technical tool but we um, we find it works really well for people even who perhaps don't tend to have a technical project because it has some really good project management tools. We also talk about things like creating a roadmap um, and a code of conduct code of conduct, code of conduct, um, and basically just making a very welcoming uh, space for people who are going to be joining your project and saying to think about how you can help people collaborate with you. Um, we then actually have an optional skill up call on the fifth week, which is normally the mentor week. Um, so you will meet with your mentor no matter what. But if you realize after week four that actually GitHub is something that you're not confident with, then you can come along and we give a more in-depth in -depth GitHub training as well. Um, but that's also optional. You can skip it if this is something you're comfortable with. Then we have a series of three open science modules for our cohort calls. So the first open science module, we uh, talk about different aspects of the, of the doing of the open science. So we tend to have information about open source software, open hardware, uh, which makes things much more affordable and maintainable than much uh, traditional scientific uh, hardware, open data, and we talk a bit about iterative and agile project management as a way of breaking down the tasks that you may have for whatever project you're working on. Uh, passing, skipping on the mentor meeting, then the next week that we have, um, we start talking about disseminating the open science that you're doing. So we talk about things like preprints, publishing your science early, uh, getting DOIs and citations for your work, particularly for non-traditional outputs. Uh, so you, you might get a DOI for a paper um, as a scientist, but there are many other things that you can get DOIs for. We talk about open protocols. Um, that is sharing the methods, the recipes for your science. And we talk about open education and training as well. Um, then finally, the third module that we have on open science is uh, FAIR science. So this is something that's been rising the last few years. It's uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as uh, the acronym for FAIR. And we just talk about different ways that you can apply that to training, to software, and to data, possibly other things as well. But it's different ways that you can apply the findable, accessible, and interoperable and reusable paradigm to your work. Um, we also have a, a optional careers call where we have people who come and they speak from various different areas um, in industry, in academia, and many other places. So we try and look at the fact that actually research and science can be done in many places and it doesn't have to be that it's always the standard academic track, but there's many ways to be a successful open uh, researcher. Um, and then the last couple of calls that we have. Uh, so we have designing and empowering for inclusivity. This is basically looking at the people who are in your community, building ways for them to contribute and also thinking about uh, who isn't there and things like implicit bias uh, as well. And I don't know how, but somewhere I've skipped over one of the calls. There we go, I missed it. We also had, I forgot to say, sorry, week nine, we start talking about personal ecology and ally skills. Uh, now by personal ecology, we mean um, taking care of yourself. So probably by the time that you've been working on this week nine, you've been working uh, for two months on whatever project it may be at least that you've been working for on OLS. And we typically find that people are a bit like, well, you know, this is exciting, this is fun, but I'm exhausted because, you know, I've been working a lot on this project. So we talk about the importance of self-care and some ways to actually manage that. And we also talk about ally skills, which is the um, care, but for other people. So stepping up when you uh, actually have some privilege or some power, that means that you can step up for other people as well. Uh, and apologies, I'm jumping around, I know, but back to where we were wrapping up. So after we've done all of those cohort calls together, 
as well as the alternating mentor meeting weeks, we have final presentations. So we have one week where we do rehearsals. So there's usually a couple of groups worth of rehearsals to make sure that we can cover all the time zones. And this is literally just talking about what you've learned or what you've done over the course of the program. Um, and you do around about a five minute uh, presentation. So you get one week where we talk about um, just practicing it and we get some feedback so we can improve it. And then we have the final graduation presentations in the final week. And these final graduation pre presentations are actually live streamed to YouTube. And we encourage people to invite their friends, their family, um, their PhD supervisor, anyone who might be interested to come along and see this. Um, and I think that's, basically it so it sort of gives you a, re a really quick overview of the program um i'm going to stop oh, actually no i'm going to switch to a couple of other quick um frequently asked questions that i think we might have so we have two questions here one um, a lot of people ask us about uh, whether or not open life science really is op only about life science and the quick answer I would say is that's definitely where we started mm -hmm. um, because all three of us, Movika, Berenice and I, we come from life science domains, but it very, very, very quickly spread beyond life science to basically apply to anyone who's interested in open research. And I would say 90, maybe more percent of the content applies to just about any open research and certainly any open science. Um, and the other frequently asked question that we quite often get, is there an easy way to see into the next slide? Here we go. Okay, is uh, if you're interested in becoming a mentor or an expert, uh, then very often the best way to do this is to run through the program. It makes it a bit easier because it means that you're familiar with the program when you're actually mentoring someone the next time around. Uh, so we would definitely encourage you to apply as a mentor or an expert if you are interested because uh, we do try and bring you back. So if you were if you were an applicant or a participant in OLS 3, then in OLS 4, we would actually um, probably, yeah, if it seemed like you were able and ready, we'd, we'd encourage you to step up as a mentor for the next round. Um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing. Do we have any questions at this point or anything I missed, Malvika Berenice? I don't think so. I think uh, we've given like really fast introduction to the program and uh, we want to use most of this time to listen to your ideas, especially re-emphasizing on if you have an idea and you don't know if this fits into our program, please uh, take this time to ask us questions and just bring that to the table. Um, one thing we should add, if you would like to ask questions, it's okay to ask them in the Zoom chat and we can read them out or uh, type them in the Google Doc as well. There's a questions and comments section that's around about, I think, on the third page, uh, but it's also okay to unmute uh, to ask questions. Um, any of those are good. Hi, hello. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, sorry, one second, I can turn on my camera. Yeah, hi, um, I have a question, and this is not thinking about me, but in general, like you are saying that if you would like to be a mentor or an expert, that might be better to participate first as participant, which makes a lot of sense. But could it be possible that, uh, I mean, people feel maybe overqualified to participate as participant, um, I don't know if there was any slide uh, about what can be the profile. Not, you know, thinking about that again. Not thinking about me, but some people might be feeling more like, is it this right a right uh, initiative for me as participant, or am I already too experienced? That's a reasonable question. Um, I would say if anyone does feel that way, um, maybe just ping us and we can discuss. Because uh, I think we want one thing that's very important also is that we actually know mentors who come into the program so that we can feel that they're going to be reliable and convey the values that are really important to us. So we'd certainly at least want to um, chat with them at, beforehand. Um, but uh, our, our email address, which will reach all three of us, is team at openlifesci.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from the chat. 
uh, from Anish, for, sorry, Anshika. Um, I'm an undergraduate student. Can I also participate in this program? And yes, definitely. Uh, we're very happy to see undergraduates apply. Um, we've had people from all sorts of different areas um, within and without academia apply in the past. So for example, one time we had a PI and all of his uh, research group participating at the same time, but we have had undergraduates in the past as well. You're all very welcome. Uh, does anyone have any questions also regarding the application process or anything like that? Um, hey, hi. Uh, I, actually, uh, I'm Anshika. I'm an undergrad student in uh, biochemistry. I am from India. And actually, I'm working on a project. Like, uh, I am learning bioinformatics also right now. So, like, I'm working on a project for, like, drug discovery by including... Uh, by including like uh, data science by using those, uh, using Lipinski descriptors and other things. Uh, so like, uh, can I also participate in this and use this as my project idea? Sounds great. Sounds much more advanced than anything I was doing in my undergrad, to be honest. It sounds amazing. <laughs> oh. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know if it would be helpful if we show the page where we have list of OLS2 projects. That sounds nice. So I'm gonna get it up on my screen first. They don't have to watch if I end up clicking the wrong thing the first time. Okie doke. Share screen. Okay, can you see that? Looking good. Okie doke. Uh, so I'm just sort of going to run through and give like a quick overview. Uh, so here's a really interesting example. We had Emma Karun, for, uh, she actually was an archaeobotanist, which is to say that um, whilst her field is um, life science, everything was dead. <laughs> so it's all really, really old stuff, which I always found incredibly fascinating uh, to listen to. And uh, we've had synthetic biology projects, we've had uh, pipelines, I think there's a lot of galaxy involved with this, for those of you who are familiar with galaxy. Um, Open Innovation in Life Sciences was a nice big conference based in Switzerland. Um, and you can see we've had people from a lot of different places all around the world. This one's actually probably a, quite a nice stretch because we had an uh, Africa-based project with a mentor based starting in Brazil and later on in Hong Kong. So we really do have quite global span for the people who actually participate. We had a Galaxy project. Uh, we had an ecology project from Taina. Um, just sort of tr trying to find some different examples of what we have. Sci for All was a citizen science project. So you can see we have a lot of different uh, domains and different areas that we had. Database for open uh, preprints. Yeah, so this was an Africa based preprint um, and open access database for COVID 19. So it was a very timely topic as well. Um, that was uh, mentored by Naomi Penfold, who used to work for ASAP Bio. So she had a lot of experience around um, preprints as well and bio biology. 3D modeling workflows. Um, so this was actually a really interesting presentation that we had for our graduations where um, we had a very nice low level explanation of engineering mechanics. And I didn't expect to see how it was gonna to correlate to um, life science at all, but actually uh, very quickly they managed to explain how nicely it does relate to things like uh, fossil reconstruction and other things to do with um, life science as well as just engineering. Uh, we had uh, projects like open science office hours. And uh, this was one that I actually really appreciated hearing about 
they talked about just providing advice for people who are interested in open science, but also figuring out how to fund people who are volunteering to offer small amounts of advice, um, which I think as, as a small open organization, we recognize how hard it can be to fund and how important it can be to fund if you want to have good representation amongst the people who are participating in what you're doing. Uh, awesome. This is actually a two-time pr uh, project and is, it has the best acronym just because you pronounce it awesome. Um, <laughs> but actually this was, I think, founded by uh, an OLS1 participant and who, who then um, passed it on to some of the people he brought in through OLS1. And as part of OLS2, these participants continued the work and so it's actually quite exciting seeing the project grow from round one to round two as well. Um, Hilia set off AP BioNet talks. I think this was launched early at the start of OLS by the end. Didn't she have something like 80 participants in the talks, the talk series that she'd launched? Uh, so again, it's really exciting watching where some of these go just from start to finish. Um, bioinformatics talks. Um, scrolling through open hardware so we had an open hardware concept uh the turing way this was a guide for ethical research something i think we're all incredibly incredibly happy to see as well we had quite a few uh projects from turing this time uh turing data stories was a uh, project that was set up to allow people to find a da find data and create a story around it in a reproducible way. So for example, um, the first story that the data stories folks started out with was um, about COVID-19 and deprivation. And they looked at some of the results that we'd heard in the news and they ran through them and they actually made it reproducible. They set it up in a Jupyter notebook so that anyone could follow the same steps of the analyses or the types of the things that you actually see in the news, but in a way that anyone could follow along and reproduce if they wish to do so. Uh, another Turing Way project that we had was actually embedding accessibility into the project, uh, which is another really important but often under-discussed aspect of many technical projects, is making sure that different people with different abilities can access the content. Um, Kate Simpson led another citizen science-related uh, project. Autistica was um, quite nice. We actually had one of the participants present in the final presentations for this one. Uh, so again, this is one of the scenarios where someone using OLS brought, um, participated in the project, brought in new contributors, then actually brought everyone on, um, brought, brought, brought them in and made them part of the project. So it's really nice seeing people progress through the different tiers of this. Um, I think those are all the ones I can give quick overviews of for now. So um, I'll stop sharing unless there's any other particular website. No, okay, look, I've got nods. <laughs> Yeah, and one more thing we want to uh, mention for this round particularly, we are starting a micro grant for the participants and the micro grant is basically enabling all our participants, especially from low income uh, or middle income research institute to ask more funding from us so that they can for example, by a headphone or webcam or anything that actually enhances their experience within OLS, but also beyond. Um, and also we want to make sure that our mentors and experts are also supported within the program. Some of the plans that we have, uh, you might have seen that we have some projects, multiple mentors. And the reason is that the mentors uh, are allowed to take break uh, if they have something going on in their life, but also mentees are also allowed to take break. If at all you feel that during the program something comes up and you're you're no longer uh, able to finish the project itself, you can still continue being part of the program as a mentee or return next time. Um, we are also looking into uh, creating a steering committee because we've seen that there have been increased inter interest from all around the world, and we understand that we have limited experience from where we come from. So our steering committee would be constituted by people from different countries who can really help us enhance the representation of our mentees from different places. There have been very uh, new upgrades in the program, which you can read in our blog post. Uh, if you've seen the website, um, in, there we have stories, which are blog posts that are posted by us every now and then to share what we are up to. 
Bernice, have we missed anything so far? No, I think you did cover both of you, everything, I think. Anyone have any more questions or want advice about how to apply? Or maybe you can also answer the questions. What do you like about the program? So we have this, these two questions in the notes. Um, what do you like about these programs and what you would like to see differently than planning this program? Could help us to, to get some feedback. How about if we... Oh, uh, sorry, we have a question uh, from the hack. Um, there's, there's a question on the application. Uh, what challenges did you face? Are, we, are you supposed to answer that? Uh, so yes, I, ideally, I think the reason we ask that is mostly that very often if you're interested in open science, it tends to be because you've seen a reason that open sci that science is closed and maybe that that doesn't work. And we just like to know a little bit about your background and your motivations. Uh, so for example, I think before I had participated in any open science, I worked for an academic spin out company and we did a lot of closed sourced code um, to do with um, knowledge management. And I got really frustrated because it ended up basically going nowhere. And we, we received lots and lots of EU grant money and we spent it on creating code that was never used by anyone. And so that for me was like a roadblock about why we are spending so much time worrying about intellectual property that actually you weren't benefiting anyone. Uh, so maybe you have some feelings around that or, or just some reason that you think it's important to share and to make science open or to make research open. Does that help? Yeah, and many of these responses actually help us pair you properly with the mentors. Um, some people in the past have also written that the primary language has been a barrier. Uh, for example, one of our colleagues from Brazil applied and we could pair them up with uh, someone who could speak Portuguese and help them advance their project in Portuguese. Uh, time zones could be a problem, which you can also mention there. Uh, just the access to information or access to open uh, science and um, data, for example, could be um, an issue. So Mac, you're saying partially yes. Can you say what is still uh, not clear yet? So while you write that, I want to read what Ajay had written. Ajay asked if it's a it's possible for the same person to be mentor and mentee, or um, if the schedule doesn't allow that. So in the in the last two cohort, we had at least one person each who were mentor and mentee. And we consistently saw that was a huge issue in terms of time commitment. So I think we would encourage that. Uh, not encourage that, sorry. We wouldn't encourage that. <laughs> so the best would be that you be a mentee for one round and return to the next round as mentor. And that would also help you become more confident about the areas that you can mentor other people on. I meant it's in the past sentence. What challenges did I face in open life science? No, I don't think we ask what challenges you face in OLS. We ask what challenges you face in open science. So those are different. Um, Daniel, you have a question? Yes, uh, hello again. Uh, so one question uh, I was just thinking, um, what about if you have like some, and you are not available one of the weeks, let's say either as mentor or as mentee, um, yeah, some issue. I mean, also because it expands a lot in a lot of weeks or even, you know, some fixed holidays, personal issues, uh, family, children, something, or, or you are over, overwhelmed with your normal work or something. So I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to that, but do do fill me, um, you and Bernice, if I miss something. Um, yes, we are aware. <laughs> so we record all our cohort calls and they go on YouTube. Uh, there, are, you know, often people are not in the same time zone to attend all the calls, so they are given the opportunity to watch it on YouTube. It's quite necessary for them to review these videos. There is also shared notes that we have. Uh, 
uh, which are uh, available to everybody that they can read even after the training program. Then another thing is that you can see that we have author transcription going on. Uh, so these author transcription are also up uploaded on YouTube. So these are all our information from training calls are archived for people to follow whenever they have time before the next cohort call. If the mentor is unable to attend one call, they can contact us so we can fill, uh, fill in instead of them. So it's important for our mentees to have a check-in, but if our mentors are unable to do it in one week or other, either you, me, or Bernice, or anybody who's available from our mentor community can step in and do that for you. And we, we really want to encourage that our mentors really take break when it's needed or um, make sure that they are not feeling overburdened by the responsibilities they have in OLS. Okay, thanks. I will add a little bit to that, that one of my favorite things was realizing that we actually needed a formal parental leave policy for OLS uh, because we actually had people go on parental leave in OLS 1 and OLS 2 and say, hey, we're so official, we need a parental leave program. Uh, <laughs> um, but one other thing I just wanted to add was that we also we encourage people to bring in um, subject experts occasionally. So um, um, on, on our website, we have a list of people who are mentors, people who are the project leads slash participants, um, and then we also have experts available. And that tends to be, let's say, um, if you're doing a project on open hardware and ecology, it's unlikely that we have that many open hardware ecology experts. So we might give you someone who's just an ecologist or just open hardware, or maybe they're just an open science practitioner. When I say just, I don't mean just, but like it's nothing, but just that the skill match may not be a 100% overlap. Um, but what that means is that you can use that cohort of experts to actually cover some of the other domains. So it could be, you know, like you're going to be at a conference in a couple of weeks and you say, hey, why don't you arrange to get an expert to come in that week um, and talk about the open hardware aspects in instead, since I won't be around. So that's one other way to help sort of arrange cover when necessary. But we're very happy to work with people being unavailable as needed. Okay, thank you. And just as a reminder, um, it's also, um, it's fine to put questions in the chat, to put your hand up um, using Zoom, or to even just to put them into the Google Doc. Okay, if I turn off the recording, um, then we can have a slightly more private uh, question and answer session if anyone didn't want to raise their voice. I'm stopping recording now. Bye everyone. Only the people who are on the recording though.